Good morning. We certainly want to welcome each of you here to our services at First Baptist Church. And for those of you that are listening and visiting online at home, we welcome you as well. As we come this day in celebration, I invite you now to stand as we ring in the hour and recognize that our Lord and Savior Christ is risen. Please stand. You may be seated. I invite you now to open your worship guide as we read responsibly our call to worship, our Easter greeting. God, your works are marvelous, your power amazing. You are astonished at what? You have raised Jesus, who was put to death at the hands of an angry multitude, who was beaten, nailed, and pierced. You have raised him to glorious life. We are astonished at this gospel. We stand now silent before you, too surprised for words. And now we raise a shout, Alleluia, that Jesus Christ put to death on a cross, now alive and ruler of the world. Again, we raise our voices, Alleluia, for death has lost its sting, the grave has overtaken my life. The new kingdom has begun. The way of love is victorious. And this gospel fills our hearts and all the earth. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah.
Today, we have the joy and privilege of baptizing Bobby Lynn Butler. Bobby has been a follower of Jesus for a long time and started attending this church about 20 years ago when his brother invited him. So today, he wants to become an official member of First Baptist Church of Front Royal. So, First Baptist members, do you all agree to pray for Bobby and encourage him as he joins as an official member? If so, will you please say amen? Amen. So, Bobby, your baptism today is a symbol of the conversion that took place in your heart. Do you confess again Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I do. So I baptize you, our brother, Bobby Lynn Butler, in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Bobby, I invite you to take a candle here and light it from that candle. As a symbol of taking your light that shines within you to all people. So go now and share that love with others. And as always, there's always room for more. So who will be the next one to be baptized? I invite you now to stand as we sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Please stand. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Earth and heaven Where thy victory, oh. 
be seated. stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in the eyes. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the word of God for the people. Let us now continue our songs of praise as we stand and sing hymn 208, He is Lord. We'll sing it two times through. Be seated. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from, for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. But go, 
tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you shall see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Again, this is the word of God for the people of God. Hey, Jameson, good morning. How are you, Camden? Good morning. Okay, we got to let's squinch in. All right. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Well, I am so glad to see all of you this day. Hey, Cece. Good morning. That's your little sister. Yeah, I know. I know it's Cece. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Can you tell me what today is? It is Easter. What? Can you tell me? Let's see. Nope. Oh, well. Okay. Well, I can talk very loudly. How's that? So, tell me, why do we have Easter? What happened today? Risen from the dead. That's right. Do you remember the, Remember how the story goes that on Thursday night he was with his disciples and they had, what did they celebrate together? Bread and juice. They had communion, right? And then after that, Jesus went out to the garden to pray and there were soldiers there. And what did they do to Jesus? They captured him and put, and put him on That's right. They arrested him and they took him to trial. And then on Friday, they crucified him on a cross. Not not exactly like this one. This one's very pretty, but it would have been something very similar where they, they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. There would be blood on it. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah I've heard about this. You heard about this? Yes. So that's what happened to him. And so then he, so that was on Friday, and he, he died on the cross, and they put him in the grave in a tomb. And then, that's right, there's a picture of, see, you can see up there on the screen, picture of of a tomb and then on Sunday morning the women went to the tomb and what did they find when they got there he wasn't there he was alive right Mm -hmm. Jesus was alive so what I wanted to talk with you about is that even though people put Jesus to death on the cross death did not have the last word God was not going to let the evil and the hate that put Jesus to death be the last word. Instead, well, if you if somebody hurt you, would you be mad at them? Would you be angry? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, God probably had a right to be mad at the people who put Jesus to death, but God didn't. Instead, God decided to raise Jesus from the dead and and decided that God was going to Continue to love everybody. So, no matter no matter what happens, what we do, some days are good, some days are bad, God is still going to love us no matter what. And that is a very important Easter message, that no matter what happens, God loves us. So Easter was God's big surprise. The empty tomb, the empty grave was a big surprise. Easter joy is present because God refused to let the bad guys win, because love always wins. So that's the good news of Easter, that Jesus is alive this day and loves each of you very, very much. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for defeating death. And thank you for the fact that love always wins. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Happy Easter, everybody.
Let us continue in our singing as we raise our voices in praise, singing hymn 217, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Please stand. Will you please pray with me? O oh, holy God, beyond our imagining and yet near to us as flesh to fingernails, we come before you this Easter day in gratitude. But we confess, O oh God, that while we like to think of Easter as a sunny and warm day full of light and sweetness and all that is fragrant in springtime, Sometimes, God, Easter is difficult because no matter what the weather is outside, on this day your world remains in so many corners, a dark and stormy place. Those who first witnessed your son's resurrection found it to be a fearful and fearsome event. For you, O oh great God of surprises, crashed into their and our reality with something new and unexpected. But on this morning, we do not want to forget the darkness of last Friday afternoon and the way by which the Easter victory about which we so happily sing this day came about. We cannot forget the way that Jesus died and the pain that he endured. This clash between your kingdom and this world was and is still fierce. Today we do praise you for all the might and power and creativity by which you won the victory over death. We praise you for raising from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great shepherd now of all of us sheep who follow him. But because we cannot and must not forget also the darkness that is even still around us, we pray this morning for all people, anywhere and everywhere, who continue to feel crushed and crucified by a cruel world and who do not yet perceive any Easter. We pray for refugees, for those in prison, and for the innocent victims of war. We pray for children who are abused and spouses who are battered. We pray for those without homes and those without means to care for themselves. 
We pray for all of those who can see no Easter light because all that is good and lovely have been eclipsed by a depression that will not lift, by chronic chronic pain that will not abate, and by a stretch of unemployment with no end in sight. O God, the things that led Jesus to the cross have not yet disappeared from the face of the earth. The need for resurrection remains stubbornly present in the lives of millions. Make us, O Spirit of the living God, life-giving spirits to minister to those in need this Easter Sunday and always. And right here in this congregation, there are also needs aplenty. So we pray for those who are marking this Easter as the first without a loved one who died this year. Be with those who feel that they need to believe in the resurrection more than ever, but are finding it more and more difficult because of what is going on in their lives. We pray for those who are sick, those who are facing tests and surgery, and those who are worried about a loved one who is ill. Be with each of us gathered on this worship service this day. Thank you for friends and family and guests who were with us this morning. Thank you for blessing us with musicians who use their talents in this place so that all of us may, through the mystery of music, be drawn closer to you. But above all, we thank you for the presence of the Spirit of the living Lord, Jesus Christ, as we encounter nothing short of your very self here this morning. May we know for sure that we have indeed been in your sacred presence. And may we all be emboldened to live an Easter life today and in the days to come. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who rose from the grave. Amen.
Got it. The guys in the back were just holding up a sign that says pulpit mic, so I know to use this one. Yay is right. Our Redeemer lives. We have gathered this day to celebrate, and it is a joy to see each of you here with your smiling faces and bright eyes. I'm so glad that you have joined us. So today I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts. You've already heard the resurrection story read from Mark. And so today we're going to hear a sermon from the book of Acts, Peter's sermon about the resurrection. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did in both Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. And all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Will you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The name of our sermon today is Instructions for Living. Well, a number of years ago, Paige started learning to drive. And if you have ever taught someone to drive, you know how nerve-wracking it can be. I really think some of my white hairs are from teaching our kids how to drive. Well, we had gone to the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of South Carolina meeting where my dad was moderating the meeting that year, and we were on our way back from that meeting and were on Highway 11. And if you've ever been in South Carolina on Highway 11, you know that it's a beautiful, beautiful drive. It runs right along the Blue Ridge, and it's fun to drive that road because of all these hills. You go up and down and up and down. Well, as Paige was driving and we came up on the top of a hill, we could see to the other hill there was something in the road. We didn't know what it was. Well, as we got closer and closer, we realized it was a person in the road. And off to the side, we saw his motorcycle. He appeared to be all by himself. He had had some kind of accident. So we had Paige stop in the road about 100 yards from where the man lay, and she turned on her blinkers to keep from someone, to keep someone from running over him. Shane jumped out of the car and ran to the man. And then we noticed that there were all these people standing on the other side of the road about 100 yards past him, just standing there, doing nothing. No one was with this man in the middle of the road comforting him. So Shane stayed with the man, and I think the man even asked him if he was a doctor. And Shane said, no, I'm a teacher. But Shane stayed with him and comforted him, comforted him and just stayed there until the emergency personnel arrived. So after we left, we talked to our kids on the way home about what you should do when you see someone in trouble. You help them. You stay with them. You comfort them. And then you tell the authorities what you saw or what you learned when they show up. We felt like these were good instructions for living. That man's friends did nothing to help him. I guess they were scared. Now, the Gospel of Mark, Mark's account of the resurrection that Bill read, leaves a lot to be desired. 
So much so that scholars think that a longer version, if you look at your Bible, verses 9 through 20 was added later. Because what is so puzzling about verses 1 through 8 is what it says about the women at the tomb. That they were scared and they ran away and they said nothing to anyone. But clearly they said something to someone because we all know that Jesus rose from the dead. We have heard of his resurrection. Clearly, those women gave testimony to what they saw and heard and experienced on that day. Another person who was an early witness and who gave a testimony about the life of Jesus was Peter. In our Acts passage from today, Peter is speaking to the Gentiles. He's preaching to them about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But Peter was not always so keen on sharing the message of Jesus with the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Earlier in this chapter, if you go back and read the first part of Acts 10, you'll see that Peter has a dream in which God tells him three times, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And at the same time, Cornelius, who was a Gentile, a centurion, had a vision from an angel telling him to go send men to bring Peter to him. Both men have dreams and they're puzzled by the meaning of them. But they pay attention to what God is trying to say to them. And they both experience transformation. Peter then expands his ministry from just the Jews now to the Gentiles. Peter accepts the invitation to the Gentiles to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And with the presence of the Holy Spirit, Peter baptizes new Gentiles into the faith. Peter says now that God does not show partiality. God doesn't just favor the Jews. God also favors and welcomes the Gentiles. All are now welcomed. When Peter is speaking to the Gentiles, he tells them stories of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He gives witness to what he has seen himself. He testifies of his own experience of Jesus. The word testify and witness find their root in the Greek word martyrs, from which we get our English word martyr. Now, normally when we talk about a martyr, we think, of someone who must die for their faith or a particular cause. But here, we are reminded that to be a martyr is to bear witness, to testify. When someone testifies to something, they give their account of what happened, what they saw, what they heard, and then how they reacted. Now, the poet Mary Oliver, she's a wonderful poet, she writes about testimony as a way of life. She says this, instructions for living a life. She says three things, three instructions. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. These are instructions for living and for being a witness. Now, how might we as Christians in 2024 live our lives as witnesses. Well, first, as Mary Oliver said, we are to pay attention. We need to pay attention for when we have encounters with the divine. When have you encountered God's working in your life or God's presence? Perhaps when you were gazing at the ocean or perhaps when you were out front royal here looking at the majesty of the mountains or perhaps when you were holding a newborn baby or maybe when you were with someone as they took their last breath or maybe you experienced God in the everydayness of life the smell of coffee brewing in the morning the marvel of running hot water in our homes 
or maybe in the preparing and eating of a delicious meal with friends or family. When our children were still at home, we would ask Paige and Reed each night to tell us when they experienced God during that day. For finding God is often as near as your next breath. But my friends, we have to pay attention. We must be attentive and be on the lookout for God's presence. Secondly, Mary Oliver encourages us to be astonished. So when was the last time that you squealed, squealed with happiness? When was the last time that you were amazed and were tickled pink at what was going on around you? When was the last time that you were surprised and that surprise created deep, joy within you. Pay attention and then be astonished. Then Mary Oliver encourages us to be witnesses and tell about it. We can be witnesses about the times that we have encountered God and God's love for us. We can be witnesses and tell of times that we are astonished at God's goodness and God's transformative love. Now, some churches practice call and response preaching. In that congregation, a preacher might ask, can I get a witness? People might begin to testify and say things like, God gave me peace, God healed my broken heart, God answered my prayer. The preacher is not looking for a courtroom testimony but someone to talk about how God has been working in their lives. That was what Peter was doing. He was giving his testimony. He was being a witness to what he had experienced through Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, National Public Radio aired a series titled This I Believe. It was a revival of a five-minute program hosted by journalist Edward R. Murrow from 1951 to 1955. Some of you may remember those years, 1951 to 1955. Well, this show encouraged both famous people and everyday people to write short essays about their own personal, personal motivation for life, and then they were read on the air. And starting in 2009, Bob Edwards started airing those stories again about what people believe. Today, this, I believe, is still encouraging people to write and to share their core values, their instructions for daily living. So if you had to write or to speak for five minutes, giving your testimony about what you believe about Jesus' presence in your life, What would you say? What would you testify to? What have you witnessed in your own life? When Peter spoke to Cornelius and his household, Peter's testimony was from his lived experience. He told the story of Jesus' life and his death on a cross and then his resurrection. And all of that pointed to the power of God who offers forgiveness, and hope. And because of his testimony, people came to know God's love and the fact that God is not partial to any certain people. Instead, God loves everyone. Now, sometimes I think if we are honest, we are afraid to tell people about Jesus We are afraid that we might have to defend our beliefs and have a debate. And we're scared that what we say isn't enough. But it is. It is enough. All of us have a story to share of our own following Jesus and how it's impacted our lives. And that is enough. 
So how has Jesus impacted your life? Those of you who show up week after week to serve hot meals to our community, despite the many frustrations that go with that, you do it because Jesus has made a difference in your life. And that's your story to tell, that you show up week after week to feed others because Jesus commanded us to. For those of you who spend countless hours making cards, writing notes, calling people on the phone, praying for others, especially people you know who are having a hard time, you do all of that because Jesus has impacted your life. That is your story to tell. You care for others because Jesus first cared for you. Some of you have been through the deep waters of grief, of illness, of addiction, of loneliness, and you know that you made it through those deep waters because of Jesus in your life. That is is your story to tell. How Jesus never let you go through it all. St. Teresa of Avila once said, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good, Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on, or, on earth but yours. Friends, you share your testimony by the way you live, by the choices you make. Christ lives through you, through your hands, through your feet, through your eyes, and through your heart. And now for those of you who showed up here today on the holiest day of the year, hoping to experience some resurrected life in your own living of each day. We have good news for you. Jesus is risen. Jesus has conquered death. So don't give up. Resurrection is possible in each and every one of your lives. Now, we are called to share this remarkable story like Peter. We are called to tell how our lives have been transformed because of faith in Jesus. Like Mary Oliver encouraged us to do, testimony as a way of life, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. What great instructions for being a witness, and what great instructions for living. Amen. On this Easter Sunday morning, we will now sing together hymn number 207, Lo, in the grave he lay. And I'll be down front to welcome anyone who might like to join our church, or if you have never made a profession of faith and would like to be baptized, I would love to talk with you about that. So let's stand and sing together hymn number 207.
from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foe. He arose a victor from the torrid domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, our soul. Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives for. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foe. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives for. Let's bow our heads and give thanks. Lord, we come to the conclusion of this service. As we approach the service, we were saddened. But in Revelation, through your word, you told us that Christ would rise. And indeed, Christ is risen. And we give thanks. And now, we have an opportunity to extend our thanksgiving to this church. And as we have given to this church, we ask that you bless the gift and the ones that give, that through their service and finances, your name would be lifted up. So we offer this 
In the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, who is risen. Amen. We continue for just a moment with a few matters of common concern. First, I'd like to welcome those who are worshiping today with us from home. Brenda Markey, Carl Ponstingel, Susan McIntyre, Deanna Heishman, Paige McMillan Goodwin and Ian Pools, Joyce Marlowe and Michelle Medlin. So we're so glad that you all joined us on this Easter Sunday morning. So to remind you that our Easter offering this year will support First Baptist Church's Laces for Faces program where we get $50 gift cards from Famous Footwear to give to elementary children in our schools who don't have tennis shoes that fit. Can you imagine going to gym class and not having tennis shoes that fit? So um, our program um, is the beneficiary of our Easter offering this day. And um, so far this year, we have helped over 60 children with shoes. And so we would love to be able to help many more kids this year. Also, there's an announcement in your worship guide about a special halal meal that we'll be having with Mohammed Safari and his family on April the 14th, right after worship on Sunday, April 14th. So you need to make a reservation by April the 7th if you would like to come. We're going to learn about Ramadan, and also we're going to hear about his family's escape from Afghanistan. So it should be an interesting time together, a time of joy and fellowship. And of course, we're going to eat together. It's going to be great. So I encourage you to come. Just let us know that you're coming. Will you please stand now for our benediction? Death does not have the last word. Jesus Christ is risen. Let us go and tell the good news. Go now in peace. Amen.